I think with the Destiny Presto 6 uh, data that looked at uh, trastuzumab deroxica and in hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer patients um, after disease progression and endocrine based therapy and no prior chemotherapy for metastatic breast cancer. It included the HER2 low and ultra low. So I think all of us are very familiar with the HER2 low, um, which looks at the immunohistochemistry scores of 1 plus and 2 plus. Um, and um, with the fish negative, but again, the ultra low is a little bit the new um, entity that this study was also looking into, which is an immunohistochemistry score of zero, but with some um, membrane staining. So it's like between zero and one. And so oftentimes, because this, based on the study results, this could potentially open a new treatment option for some of our patients that were previously not um, candidates for her two directed therapy, like with uh, trastuzumab deroxycan. Um, I think it's always important, and Dr. Gaddy Mays mentioned also, like, you know, just speaking and working very closely with the pathologists and asking them, you know, to potentially take another look at, at the, you know, to see if they can find any HER2. Because again, that would open a potential uh, treatment option for for patients who would otherwise not be eligible for for a treatment like uh, TDXD. Yeah, metastatic um, breast cancer, especially the hormone receptor positive um, metastatic breast cancer. There's, you know, lot. It's a very exciting uh, moment right now because we do have a lot of different. Um, you know, medications that are being approved. And so one of the things she focused on was, um, you know, looking at liquid biopsies and looking for targetable mutations. So I think, again, we're all pretty familiar with the ESR1 mutation and treating our patients with ls um, And now with the PIC3 um, or P PI3K AKT P10 pathway, again, we do have other options as well. Um, with the PIC3CA up until recently, you know, alpolicid fulvestran was the was the treatment of choice, um, alpalicid being a, a medication that has been quite difficult to tolerate for our patients. And so now since the approval of Capiva Certib, um, that's another potential new option. Um, what I found interesting in her discussion is she did mention, you know, in patients who do have a P10 or AKT1 mutation, then Capiva Certib, and we know is, is a great treatment option, but with the pic 3 ca um, she mentioned that it seems like alpolicid, because of the overall survival data, still might be her um, treatment of choice. And so I thought that was very interesting. Um, in addition, in the metastatic breast cancer setting, um, she also spoke about the Inavo 120 data, which is a study that looked at Inavolisib plus um, palbociclib plus fulvestran. So the two study arms were looking at um, you know, palbo plus fulvestran with the inavolisib or placebo. Um, and again, that was also a phase three um, study with um, looking at patients with the pic 3 ca mutation who had relapsed during or within 12 months of endocrine therapy. And so um, what the study showed is that the inavolisib palbo uh, fulvestran um, arm was associated with sustained benefit beyond disease progression. So that really delayed chemotherapy administration. Um, and it seemed like it had a very uh, manageable safety and tolerability um, that was reflected in the PROs. Um, so again, supporting the use of this drug. However, Dr. Gaddy Mays did caution, you know, and she did mention that, you know, we always have to think about our patients with metastatic breast cancer. We always want to make sure that their quality of life is, is optimized. And so whenever we introduce an additional drug, that also comes with some toxicity. Um, and so again, I think, you know, once we start using this medication, we'll have a better sense of how, how well it's actually tolerated and, and how patients do. You know, it's a very exciting time to be in oncology, especially because there's so much ongoing research. Um, I do really appreciate that there's a lot of focus, not only in, you know, like phase one, two, and three uh, clinical trials, but also I feel like there's more and more real world data, um, which I think is very important also to see really, you know, because oftentimes our patients, when we see them in clinic, they don't necessarily meet all the criteria that they did for the trial, but you know, when we have a 
a patient in front of us, we always have to make that determination of whether or not we think they would potentially benefit for certain medications or, you know, newer therapies. And so, um, again, I like the fact that there was quite a lot of emphasis on real world data in the patient reported outcomes is another um something else that I really appreciate. Again, just always remembering that all the efforts that we put into research and development, um, you know, our end goal is really to benefit the quality of life and, you know, life expectancy and um, of our patients. So th that, that's something that I found um, very interesting. It, it was a really great event um, because, again, I think they touched upon some of the key highlights of abstracts or, you know, late breaking abstracts that that were going to be presented within the next few days. So especially when there's so much going on in so many different disease groups, it's really great to hear from experts like Dr. Eng and Dr. Gadi Mays, you know, and what they're really focusing on and what, what studies they think are going to be really groundbreaking and practice changing. Um, so because of that, and I really enjoyed the event, um, that being one of the reasons. Um, and again, overall, I think it was very well organized. They were very um, systematic in how the approach was. So Gaddy Mays focused on, you know, hormone receptor positive early stage breast cancer, then metastatic, then HER2, then triple negative. And so I think for, for the audience, that makes it very easy to follow. Um, and, and again, just I really appreciate their input in, in really understanding what are some of the abstracts that they're most excited about considering, you know, the panelists were, are, you know, experts in the field. I think one of the uh, fun things about ASCO is also like just reconnecting with a lot of, um, you know, former colleagues from, you know, different walks of life. So I um, I got to see a lot of my friends from residency who are now doing medical oncology in various different um, programs throughout the country. And so it's always nice to to catch up with, you know, friends and make new friends and, um, you know, network with different people who may have the similar interests that that could lead to potential collaborations and, and research and um, yeah, overall, it's just such a great environment uh, to be in, and everybody's very enthusiastic and excited about the new data, and um, so so I always return home very refreshed. <laughs>